Okay, let's uh, let's do this. So we've been talking about threads. Uh, definitely, there, there's a lot to threads. So I, I, I'm hoping to basically cover the last of the stuff uh, for, for this class. Uh, so l last time we kind of made up some random kind of uh, uh, some sort of calculation. I, I figured it would be kind of nicer if we if we had an actual real calculation. So this is uh, this is a rendering problem. So essentially. I'm drawing an image, basically, uh, hopefully there's not too much extra graphic stuff here. So, I mean, a, a pixel on the screen consists of a red brightness, a green brightness, and a blue brightness. And then I've got, uh, let's see, one XY pixel out of a whole, like a 2D grid, right? So I've got uh, uh, width, width and height is my big block of pixels. And, and essentially, all, all you do to draw stuff, and this is true for drawing basically anything, you loop over all the pixels and you draw the pixels. So this is the standard way to sequentially draw stuff. Uh, th there's a lot of image formats in the world. PPM, kind of a weird one. Uh, the, the nice part of a PPM, it's got this tiny little ASCII header that says basically the size of the image. And then it's got the binary RGB data. So I, I like it because it's like literally three lines to make a PPM image. And uh, Netrun is actually set up so that uh, it looks to see if you wrote a file named out.ppm, and if so, it basically just converts it to something the browser can deal with, and that's the... So, so w w weird part about this, uh, this particular... So, so you can see that there's like, you know, half a dozen lines to draw the thing. Uh, and uh, th th this, is, this is all the code to take an XY pixel and to figure out the RGB color. So what's happening in here is kind of weird. Uh, this is the Mandelbrot set, and it's essentially just doing complex squaring. And this doesn't really have anything to do with assembly language, but kind of a funny, weird thing. Uh, you take floating point numbers, so Z is the complex number that I'm sitting at. And if, uh, if I was willing to use the complex arithmetic library, it would literally be Z equals Z squared plus C. So C is the pixel you're trying to render. And then all you do is you just do this squaring. I mean, it seems weirdly simple. Uh, if, if you square real numbers, right? Uh, I mean, there's kind of this interesting aspect with real numbers where if I take like 0 0.5 and I square it, I get 0 0.25. And I square that and I get 0. Point, uh, smaller than 0 something, something, something. Uh, whereas if I start like 2, I square it, I get 4. I square that, I get 16. So, so the, the, there's kind of two things that can happen. One is that the number stays small, and the other is the number like blows up to infinity. Uh, there, there's some theory that says uh, if the complex magnitude, this is just taking you know the imaginary squared plus real squared, if, it, if it's greater than four, then you, it's going to blow up to infinity. So you can stop. So w w crazy part of the Mandelbrot set is if you draw uh, which numbers blow up and which ones don't, or how, how, how many iterations they do until they blow up, uh, you do not get sort of the same simple thing you'd expect from real numbers. You get this amazingly complex object. This is this is the Mandelbrot set, and uh, th so the the blue channel is the number of iterations we got before it blew up. So the, the, so th this is blue, uh, this is not. I'm I'm doing some kind of like fancy coloration to, to let you see the phase of the complex numbers. So that that's that's these these pretty colors, but. Uh, this is not clear what the heck is happening in that image, and if you zoom in, you get basically more of that stuff happening in there. I mean, w weird part of the Mandelbrot set is like this little dot is actually the whole Mandelbrot set again. Which is weird. But if you zoom into the same spot on this little dot, you get another copy of the dot, and, and they get sort of ever more elaborate patterns surrounding them. I mean, it's, it's kind of a it's so. Uh, th th there's essentially an infinite amount of detail <laughs> in these you know 30 lines of code. Uh, it's, it's really fun if you can find an interface that lets you zoom, and you know you can just keep zooming. Actually, you tend to keep zooming until you run out of bits in whatever number you're using to represent locations, and then and then you just get this big blurry uh, uh, round off uh, stuff. So it's kind of a kind of a fun, cool thing. So it's, it's something kind of interesting uh, for you to know about. Uh, one thing I like about it, as far as a benchmark, is that, hey, it looks pretty. If you mess it up, it looks different. Uh, uh, sometimes still pretty, but uh, uh, you can you can just kind of look and see like okay that's the Mandelbrot set, I, I know I know what I'm supposed to get, and uh, you notice there's no other accesses, it's, it's, so there's no this is all in registers. In other words, we don't have to pound on memory, so it's really pure compute bound. It naturally uses floating point numbers. There's no obvious way the compiler can optimize this without you know 
breaking the laws of physics because it's calculating lots of interesting things for free. So it, uh, so it, it, it kind of a nice little benchmark program. This is the only memory access it does is to write pixels to the image. And it, uh, you know, it's fairly spendy, right? It, there's this loop that goes to 100 per pixel. Right? It, it, it may stop earlier than that, but like the, the, you know, the worst case is 100. So it literally is like 80 nanoseconds per pixel because you get this pretty big loop. It's got a you know, branch inside of it. And, and there's 100 iterations. Ah, and uh, you can, let's see. So you can, you, can, you can also kind of dial the number of iterations and get a, a different amount of complexity. So for example, if I only have 10 iterations, you can kind of see this edge is pretty simple for now. Right? And then basically the more iterations you do, you get more and more detail at the, at the boundary right, around the edge of the set. So a fun, fun thing. Uh, yeah. Can I ask you a random question? Yeah. Related? Sure. Uh, complex numbers are basically just you know, vectors. Yeah, I, I, I get like a real and an imaginary. It's just two floats. So, uh, so uh, would just multiplication of two complex numbers be more or less a rotation? Uh, or like, what, what, like, what's the intuition for the multiplication? Uh, okay. Two so, so th this is z squared. So, so to square a, a real number, you square the real. And then the imaginary part has uh, so, so a, a, a complex number. Uh, yeah. so, so that looks like the determinant basically. Ah, that so, so essentially it's just this thing squared. And, and, and essentially all this is is foil. Oh. So you end up getting like, so, so this comes out as A squared. B squared actually has I squared on it. And of course, a, I squared equals negative one. So this is, this is A minus B squared is the way. Uh, it, it turns out this, this is the real part. And then, then we get the sort of cross terms here, and that's uh, 2 a b i. That's literally 2 a b. So, so, so you, your new imaginary component, I mean, you basically just do the, the old, hopefully, algebra 2 era rules of arithmetic. Right, was it calculus? Where do they cover complex numbers nowadays? <laughs> they skip them. We did it in 50Q and linear. Mm. You hope it's an algebra two. I mean, yeah, definitely it should be in trig because yeah, uh, yeah. So so uh, luckily from our point of view, it doesn't matter at all. This is basically just uh, this is the same meaningless loop that does some compute, right? and it, it takes a certain amount of time. So if if I do a thousand iterations, you can see we get this really detailed, nice, clean little boundary, and uh, uh, and it takes more time, right? So it takes six hundred nanoseconds per pixel. So if we want to render this faster. For example, if, I, uh, uh, if, if you run the numbers on this, the, if this is 600 nanoseconds per pixel, and I want to do the 100 million pixels per second it takes me to get my 4K screen uh, in real time, I can't do 100 million nanoseconds, uh, 100 million pixels per second if they take 600 nanoseconds apiece. So it'd be nice to get that down into the like six nanosecond region. Uh, there's, there's no way that we're going to cover today to do that. Uh, so, how, how could you speed this program up? Ah, uh, well, I, I guess uh, it's, uh, this is the only part that we're benchmarking. I'm not even measuring the time to write it out, although storing the image is pretty quick. Uh, I don't think it costs 600 nanoseconds to fix it. So, yeah, I got a loop. Run the loop in parallel. Now, uh, obvious question is, is it safe to run the loop in parallel? And the answer is not always yes. Uh, so, uh, in particular, if I if I had multiple threads working on one of these, what uh, what problems is that going to cause? In particular, like uh, I'm writing to different areas in this image. If two threads are trying to write to the same data at the same time, that's a problem. Will that be a problem if we, so let's see, I guess the easy way to do this is I'm just going to put a uh, pragma OMP parallel 4. <laughs> so run it in parallel. And I, I've, I've, I've ran it, I got two loops, so we're going to have to figure out which one is better to do. So uh, is this safe? Is this going to give the right answer? What do you expect? Y yes, it's safe. What, why? What? What makes it safe? Uh, the draw function is telling each one to go to their own. Yeah. 
so so in particular, you really got to think about what is this program? Is is this thing thread safe? Well, it's thread safe as long as uh, we're writing to different parts of the image, right? So the image is a big array, and if I'm writing pixels over here and you're writing pixels over there, they're in an array. We should be good. Yeah. I mean, just like kind of the idea. Imagine you just have a picture that's four pixels. You know, just one, two, three, four. Yeah. You make one thread that goes to each part of the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. Yeah. Overly simplified, but that's sure. kind of the idea that that would yeah. be thread safe. So I'm I'm writing my pixel, you're writing your pixel. There's no like yeah, overwriting pixel. So yeah. Uh, so let so let's try this. So we get uh, 600 nanoseconds to start with, quad core machine. So we're hoping for like you know 200 nanosecond regime. Ah, all right, we we'll hit two, 200. So that's that's cool. That's uh, you notice this is only a 3x speed up, 600 to 200. It's okay. It's a 3x speed up. It's 300% faster. We can do better. <laughs> we could get 400, maybe. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not really sure we can do 400. Uh, so, hey, that's, uh, th that's cool. Uh, is, uh, if, if, I, if I move this around, can we get uh, better? I, I guess we can probably get down to 150. Oh, apparently not. Uh, so... It's a good question exactly why this might be. So, uh, I, I, obvious question, like uh, this, this program, so if I zoom out a tad so you can see the whole image, my text starts to get kind of scarily small. Ah, uh, these, so, so if, if, uh, if, if I divide this image up, uh, so each thread gets a chunk of the image, if you get the bottom half of the image, these pixels basically start this iteration loop and they immediately say, yeah, it's not gonna work. <laughs> it blows up. But whereas you can see, these, these are the blue ones. So, so uh, uh, the blue channel is the iteration count. So, uh, oh, it's unreadable now. But uh, blue channel equals iteration count. And uh, but basically, the performance is really different on the top and the bottom of the image. Right? So, if, if you get a thread that's up here, every one of your pixels is doing a thousand iterations. And if you get uh, uh, pixels down here, every one of your pixels is doing like two or three iterations. So these threads have much less work to do than those threads. Yeah. Split it in a different way. So, so it, it actually happens that splitting across X is slightly friendlier than splitting across Y, but neither of them are really that perfect, right? And it, it, X at least breaks up this big chunk into a few slices. Yeah, so uh, let's see. So, so the, the, there's this nice schedule tag. So, so this is this is one of these cases where actually OpenMP says, "I'll just take your loop and I'll do something sensible," and it's not always what you wanted. So, uh, lots of options here for schedule. So, so for example, I can say schedule in blocks of uh, 16. So this is 16 rows at a time, and that uh, uh, you, you, usually this breaks up your big uh, uh, chunks of work. If I did that. Ah, uh, I've forgotten the, the syntax here. Uh, schedule static, 16, hopefully. Yes. Oh, okay. So if we do the scheduling right, so, so what, this, what, this, what this tells us is we just asked it to say, take a blocks of 16 rows and give them to a thread. And then the next thread does the next 16 rows and the next thread does the next 16 rows. So essentially we've taken this big image. Instead of the contiguous blocks, we've said do little teeny mini blocks. Yeah. The way you made this into parallel with the threads, all you had to do was add pragma. One liner. Okay. Like OpenMP feels way too easy. Yes. You didn't have to change anything about your two for loops. Ah, because uh, these for loops happen to already be thread safe. And, and this is a nice part about image renderings is just naturally parallel. Okay, cool. Just double checking. That's yeah. too fast. It's, 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 uh, OpenMP is way too easy, right? Especially if you're used to kind of like manually creating threads one at a time, uh, OpenMP is like scarily easy. And, and, uh, and you notice my performance got like scarily good, right? I, I, I started at 600 nanoseconds per pixel. With four uh, th cores, I got down to 115 nanoseconds per pixel. Yeah. Ah, yeah. You, uh, you're not going to use the graphics card by accident for now. Uh, the, 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 so 
uh, ways, so, so let's see. Uh, OpenAC is a, uh, uh, a compiler supported thing where you'd say like Pragma, I forget what their syntax uh, that they ended up choosing was, but the idea was that the compiler would somehow take your loop and make it run on the graphics card. Which, which is cool, right? And, is that the, and, and it's because people got used to like this being really easy to get multi-core. And, and it's, it, it is definitely true that OpenMP is an extremely easy way to get multi-core if, if your program is just a loop. Yeah. Uh, the syntax is super weird to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, this, this, is like a, this is like a pound and clued or something, right? Like... Uh, it, it's it's sort of a meta command to the compiler, and 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 it's uh, yeah it's it's really not C syntax at all. Like C is you know new line insensitive uses curly braces. Like schedule static is just like it's totally like what is this? I was expecting a for loop, <laughs> right? Uh, so yeah, so 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 Pragma is line oriented, and uh, yeah, it, you could tell like I had forgotten exactly how to do the syntax for schedule static. <laughs> so uh, it's 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 uh, this is a, a Actually, uh, OpenMP was designed for Fortran, which has a lot of do loops, and then you know uh, people tend not to do systems programming in Fortran, so it's it's really hard to figure out how to like make threads to to do the work. Yeah. When you say parallel core, does it only uh, parallelize the very that loop? Yep. And and you notice there's like there's an X loop, there's a for loop inside of the code we're calling, and none of those get parallelized. Just that for loop, yeah. And uh, surprising thing about uh, about this is, so, so what's happening here? So let, let's just measure the performance. So the performance is, uh, yeah, it's not as good. Why not? I mean, it's still blocks of 16. I claim the basically the load balance should be pretty similar. Well, what's the difference between putting a fragment out here versus putting a fragment in here? Yeah, this actually does does the pragma stuff a thousand times, which is kind of crazy. It's it's still it's still fairly cheap because uh, so uh, uh, official thing. If you make threads, making threads is expensive. Flags down the OS, like you know, uh, it involves another core. And uh, standard thing is that they say, well, if you've got to make threads and destroy threads a bunch of times, you should just leave the threads alive and then fire them up again. OpenMP does that. So the first time it hits this, it's going to fire up a bunch of threads, and that's that's as appallingly slow as it really you know as you expect. But then uh, uh, in this loop, when it hits it again and again and again, the threads stay around, and it's very well tuned for that. Yeah. I think you can do it for both the loops, but I, I think uh, the outer one wins. Like once it's already parallel, it's like it, it you don't need any more parallel there. So my guess is this is like the 115 nanos. Yeah. So that's the performance of just doing this one, and I believe this one has done literally nothing. I I, I think I think it's literally exactly the same code. Yeah. I, I think that's a timing fluke. Yeah. Yeah. Timing. Uh, that's that's more or less random timing noise. Uh, so yeah, so, so OpenMP, it's, it's really easy. And uh, in general, like uh, if I've got a bunch of loops in the program, you want to put the you want to put the pragma as far out as you can, you know, the, the outermost loop, because that'll that'll give the threads more work to do, right? Bigger chunk of work is, is generally better. Uh, th there are some loops that you can't. Uh, so so uh, actually, a lot of simulations, for example, they they say like. For time equals zero to end of time. Uh, for, you know, start at one end of the domain, go to the other domain, start at the other axis, we work your way across that. And you can, you can parallelize stuff like across, like splitting up space, no problem. What happens if you split up time? Yeah, so basically, like, uh, you know, we're going to be simulating the path of this rocket. And you just start the rocket when it's halfway, you know, to wherever it's going to end up. Like, I don't know, I have no idea what the situation is halfway up. Like, the rocket may have exploded, like, two inches off the launch pad. So, like, I don't know where I'm, how I'm supposed to do that. Uh, so, so, hard to parallelize the time loop. And in particular, this, this shows itself up as saying, like, uh, like, these loops are parallel loops, right? Because everybody's writing the independent parts of the image. And I don't, like, read your part of the image, figure out what my part of the image should be. So, the problem with the time loops is that it's dependent, right? Yeah. This thing totally... If you're writing a normal type of image, yeah. I, I can see how this could be totally fine. Yeah. But this is a fractal where you can 
infinitely zoom in? Does that have uh, the exact same uh, thing? No, not, not, not as much as you think. Okay. <laughs> Never mind then. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it turns out most images, like if uh, if I take a you know a cell phone camera and take a picture of this room, you get a certain amount of detail. But like if I take a scanning tunneling electron microscope and I look at the weird slats on the woody thing in the back of the wall, I bet there's all sorts of interesting patterns that like you couldn't see with a normal camera. So there's there's a lot there's usually a lot of detail that you're not uh, you're so not showing. Basically, the, the limiting factor of how far we're zooming into this track was just. Pixel. When it hits yep. the pixel, it's just like, okay, that's as far as I can get. Yeah, well, in particular, I just calculate a color for a pixel, and it's kind of the color for probably one corner of the pixel or something. Uh, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yep. So, uh, yeah, so this was super easy, which is good. Uh, so I should give you this example, I guess. So, so basically, uh, so this is, this is OpenMP, and... Uh, and, and literally, like, uh, a lot of rendering problems are just, uh, there was this term, embarrassingly parallel, like, oh, it's so shameful that it's so easy to make this get great performance. I'm so sorry. Like, there's, not, there's nothing, like, embarrassing about the fact that it's, it's, it's a, so the, the new approved terminology is naturally parallel. Like, naturally inspiring, it, uh, it just, you know, it's, it's parallel, and uh, that's great. Right, that's uh, that's that's perfect. So, uh, so, so in particular, be, because this problem is naturally parallel, we can, you know, it's easy to make uh, make it have good performance. There's lots of problems that aren't. In, in general, actually, like uh, a lot of search type problems, a lot of like uh, you know, count, make a list of uh, the, these problems are actually a lot harder to make them parallel. So, so I so let me show you the the example here. So, for example, if I want to know which of these. Uh, so, so I, I have a million pixels there, and I want to know uh, which of them have uh, big iteration counts. And in particular, how many of them hit a thousand? So, how how would I figure out who hits a thousand? Yeah. So I just say like, did you hit a thousand? So, uh, if iter equals a thousand, then uh, th th then what? So, uh, I could print off. So I could say now. Uh, I, I believe there are several hundred thousand that uh, uh, several hundred thousand pixels do, in fact, max out the iteration count. So I think I, I just I just want to know how many. So I'm just going to have a counter somewhere. Uh, so count uh, starts off at zero, and uh, I mean super simple. So okay, there we are. Uh, and then then I could print out uh, how, what the count is. So now my count is equal to there's the count. Is this thread safe? Well, uh, who is going to be writing to count? All the threads. <clears throat> That's a problem. Uh, so uh, oh. apparently, I already had a count somewhere. Would it be thread safe for each thread to maintain a count, and at the very end, join them up in some way? Yes, except. Uh, it, it's actually kind of annoyingly hard to have every thread do its own separate variable because I, you know I'm not even I'm not making threads. I don't really even know how many threads got made. Oh. Like it's a little little harder in OpenMP. Uh, frustrating. So, uh, count is unambiguous. Oh, count count is also an algorithm. Oh my gosh, we lost count. So this is the big count. I should not, so this this is why uh, using namespace std is really bad because uh, there's a standard count that takes two iterators and a value and if you just say count plus plus it's like I'm not really sure if you want to you know increment a function I don't pro tip uh, so the, 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 there's the count I don't know that looks reasonable right 193,288 sure so let's run it again and see if uh, just magically oh. 191,418, that's about the same, right? It's almost equal. Uh, these counts are wrong. They're wrong because threads are overwriting each other's work. And we're not quite getting the same number every time we run the program, which is really bad. So in particular, if, if, if you say, uh, you know, we're, so, so uh, this happens all the time in real programs, right? Uh, I loop over all the students in the UAF database and I look to see which ones are eligible for the scholarship. And uh, sorry, kid. 
you just, uh, you know, because we, uh, we were trying to look for the uh, uh, students in parallel, we just overwrote your eligibility. And like, how many students are eligible for the scholarship? Ah, uh, four, 400, four again. Right? Like, this is, this is not good. Ideally, a program that's rendering one image gives you a fixed number. So, so, this, is, so, so this is not thread safe because it's a global variable. We, uh, we, we clearly should have known uh, that uh, that, was, that was no good. Ah, what do we do about this? So separate counter per thread is kind of an ideal way to do it. Uh, OpenMP doesn't make it super easy to do that. And in particular, you notice th this is where we actually make this decision that is not thread safe inside some function. Uh, and then out here is where we're basically doing all the OpenMP stuff, which is kind of you know, the color of that function. Uh, in, in real programs, it tends to get pretty attenuated, right? I've got the whole database stuff and the looping over it. And then it's calling, you know, uh, financial aid, eligibility, et cetera, et cetera, right down and down to the scholarship um, submodule. And the problem is, like, the connection between these two uh, sort of pieces of code is pretty tenuous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's actually probably a better way to do it. And in particular, I, I've certainly had cases where OpenMP just doesn't give me enough control. Right. I, I want to make the threads myself so I can say that thread gets its own counter, that thread gets its own counter. I do a certain amount of stuff in parallel, and then I combine the threads up uh, at the end. And uh, it's a lot more code to do that. I mean, it, uh, the, the one-linerness here. And then where if you want to have no threads, you just comment out that line, and you get no threads. Like, this is, this is good. Uh, so there are other ways to do this. And in particular, if you're writing a library, that might get called by multiple threads. You kind of can't rely on your caller to do some fancy thing to save your, you know, your your, uh, your access. So in particular, if your library has a global counter somewhere, you have to do this increment in some fancy way to make this not to make this work for multiple threads. So uh, several different cool ways to do this. So uh, the sort of most general one, and this should be your kind of knee jerk uh, uh, response is uh, to use a mutex. Sure, mutex. So mutex is called a mutual exclusion device. Uh, and it's basically, I make a standard mutex. So this, this protects the count. So this is the lock for the count. Yeah? It, it turns out basically anything that is uh, uh, at runtime, there's only one of them. So I, or I, I, could, I could say static int big count. And it turns out you have exactly the same problem because two threads, there's only one copy in memory. All the threads are going to be hammering away at that one copy and breaking each other's stuff. So, uh, so essentially, uh, the way a mutex works is that I can forbid anyone else from grabbing the mutex by locking it. And then I can uh, uh, let other people back in by unlocking it. So this works exactly like a bathroom stall door. <laughs> you. You lock it, you gotta lock it before you go in or it does not help, right? If somebody goes in and accesses this without locking the stall door, then you're not gonna be able to exclude uh, uh, everything's, everything's broken. Uh, so you need to remember to lock it. And then you also need to remember to unlock it because otherwise it stays locked forever, which uh, is, is problematic. Uh, so let's see, so let, let's see if this A works. Uh, I may have gotten the syntax wrong. I've been doing it a lot today. All right. Nailed the syntax. Okay, we get 213,844 this time. Let me try running it again and see if we get exactly the same number. 213,844, that is the same number. All right. Now, there's only one problem with the mutex. It, uh, there is a performance overhead to locking and unlocking. And, and this is, in particular, why uh, you don't, you, uh, mutexes are not there by default, right? Uh, so, so, for example, uh, standard vector. If I, if I do a pushback, if I do a resize, if I do anything that might reallocate the vector, it can actually break if I'm doing that from multiple threads at once. And uh, it's because they don't lock the modifications on the vector. And uh, that was, this is kind of a controversial choice nowadays, right? If, you, if I've got a data structure that like, you know, I hand around between multiple threads, it kind of would be nice if the data structure protected itself against being accessed by multiple threads. In other words, the data structure could have a lock inside of it. The reason they don't is because this has a, a runtime overhead. So if you, uh, let's see, 
we should do one little micro benchmark, I guess, to figure out what the what the overhead is. It, it turns out to be it's it's bad, but it's not really that bad. So I guess a simple way to find this. So I'm I'm just going to grab the lock and then release the lock and then see how fast that is. So the super scaled down version of this program, and all, all I'm doing this for is just to see what the performance is like. Sure, whole program time it and we should might as well look at the disassembly so you, you do this and uh, let's uh, and did I return a float okay so run it running it and uh, it's it's 20 nanoseconds to, to lock and unlock which you know c compared to the one nanosecond to call a function is pretty bad oh uh, so Declaring a lock, it's it, and it's it's the locking and unlocking of the lock that uh, that is actually expensive. Uh, so so I, I believe internally there's some sort of bus operation that has to happen every time you grab the lock, because uh, uh, essentially two cores can be trying to grab the same lock at the same moment, and 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 somehow the the, the hardware actually makes these guarantees that like only one of them will get the uh, will, will will get the lock. Yeah, so, so it, internally, I, I believe this uh, lock is just an int. And essentially, all that happens is when you say lock, you, you do an operation that will set it to 1, and then verify, and then read what the old value was. And if the old value was 0, then you got the lock. And if the old value was uh, already 1, that means somebody else was in the lock before you. So uh, it, it, essentially, there's a yeah, har hardware implementation of mutex is something we should probably talk about, but not today. Uh, so here I believe they, just, they call pthread mutex lock and pthread mutex unlock. This is, so uh, pthreads are the underlying thread library on Linux. And uh, so, so basically it, uh, it, it, calls, it calls this thing. You notice it doesn't actually have to involve the OS, but it does, it does uh, there's, there's some reasonably expensive hardware operation in there. There's actually a, there's an instruction prefix called lock. That, that, that makes certain guarantees about what other cores are doing, and and that's that's one of the reasons I, I always think of it as, as uh, uh, the, the name for mutex. The official name is a mutex, a mutual exclusion device, but uh, I, I always call them locks, and uh, uh, locks is kind of a pretty standard uh, uh, term for it. So twenty nanoseconds. What? Uh, how how bad is that? And can is there some way to do better? I mean, the cool part about a lock is that uh, I grab the lock, I can now do anything arbitrarily unsafe in here, and it's suddenly basically thread safe because only one thread is doing the stuff that's protected by the lock. I've essentially dropped down a single thread at execution here. So I can push stuff back to a vector, I can do, you know, you, you name it, uh, arbitrary computations, which is, which is cool, right? Uh, uh, locks are pretty general purpose. I see locks a lot on things like databases or network stacks or, you know, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're 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 pretty uh, general purpose and powerful. The, the downside is that they're they're not really that fast. This isn't as bad as an OS call, but it's way worse than like a integer you know, arithmetic memory access. Yeah. Uh, because we're only doing the lock when an iteration blows up to infinity. Would it be yeah. A possible thing be just rewrite the program, figure out a way to do this that doesn't. So, so, so and, and in particular, this is kind of the ideal way to do locks, is if some weird situation happens, you grab the lock and then you handle the weird situation, that's, that's usually fairly safe, uh, because you're only paying this overhead if the weird thing happens. So, so error handling stuff should probably have locks around it. Actually, uh, some sort of weird multi-threaded thing that only happens when you get errors in two threads at once. That's, uh, that's been kind of a festival of uh, like browser bugs. Actually kind of surprising. A lot of uh, image processing libraries. They're multi-threaded, right? I can have two threads like parsing Im two images at the same time and browsers like this because they got lots of threads and there's lots of images coming in. The problem is if there's an error in parsing the image, then oftentimes they actually fall back to like a, essentially it's like, you know, they get global variables that say what to do when uh, there's an error in the image. Uh, or, or, or they, they say, uh, I'm going to write uh, into this global variable the location in the image where it went bad, which sounds safe, I except, uh, for example, browsers will like try to parse the image, and if it fails, they'll try to continue from where they left off, which seems like, yeah, okay, semi-sensible. Now, if two threads in the same browser are both parsing bad images at the same time, 
then uh, it's possible to structure it so that uh, basically when uh, one error happens and then the other error overwrites the index for the first error. So when the browser tries to restart, it's actually reading from bad memory and potentially like destroying your machine at that point. And of course, like uh, the banner ad that somebody launched could just have a huge stack of bad images that are structured, they're bad in a very specific way to destroy your machine, which is really, this is, this is no good. So uh, grabbing locks before doing anything weird is actually a, a fairly reasonable idea. I've seen a lot of code that actually says like, I don't know if there's even threads in this program, but I'm grabbing a lock anyway, because I'm scared. And it's, you know, 20 nanoseconds is just the insurance cost that you pay for like guaranteeing that this stuff has no threads Started stuff happening in, in set there. Ah, right. And, and in, in particular, th there's kind of this ongoing debate, like, should your libraries all just do the locks themselves, just uh, so that that way, belt and suspenders, even if the program has no threads, that's just pure waste of time. Uh, or, uh, or should you just say, like, look, all libraries are unsafe if you, you know, if you're doing, you know, one library call and, uh, right there, have one library object, like a standard vector, and I'm doing operations for multiple threads at once, all bets are off. Like, just, uh, it's, the, the debate is ongoing. Uh, Java resolved this in favor of objects should all protect themselves. All the Java objects have locks inside of them. This is one reason Java is considered slow, because it grabs locks to make everything thread safe, supposedly. But the problem, of course, is like even if the vector is itself thread safe, it's not going to seg fault because the vector like messed itself up. If I have two uh, 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 two different threads just slamming weird stuff at different locations of the vector, then they'll overwrite each other's work and still still disaster. Uh, so, so the rationale for putting the locks out on the caller of the library is the caller of the library can actually make sure the program gets the right answer. Rationale for putting them inside is that uh, the, the library gets the, gets the right answer. So I, I don't know, so, so locks are great. It's just that uh, if I have something cheap to work on, the lock is an expensive way to make that cheap operation safe. So there's, uh, so I, I guess I should give this one. So this is the micro benchmark for a lock. And uh, I don't know, th there, are, there are other operations you can use here. So for example, uh, there's a header called atomic. And, and this is from the old Greek atomos, right? Uncuttable. So I can make an atomic int. And uh, the idea with the atomic int is that it's actually going to directly use some sort of cool hardware uh, uh, instructions to make this thread safe. And uh, so let's try this, see if I get the syntax right. Nope. And uh, initializing atomics apparently is slightly harder. I think uh, I think you can initialize it like that. There we go. So uh, an atomic, you notice, is like uh, it's almost fourfold faster than a lock. And uh, internally, so there is an assembly language prefix called lock, and uh, it only works on a subset of instructions. But add, you know, so this, this wasn't lock ink, this was lock add. Uh, so, so lock add is totally a thing. And this is saying, take this counter and then add one to it. And if another thread is trying to add one to it at the same time, you guys got to work your stuff out. So, so this is, this is kind of cool. This is actually, it, it, it works just like putting a mutex around that one instruction. And uh, hardware seems to be optimized for that. Actually, this is appalling with that. Atomic operations seem crazy fast on GPUs. Uh, which is good because they don't have any other kind of locks. Uh, so, uh, so, so uh, uh, atomic is is good, and it, uh, uh, it actually this this int is basically just an int, and they've just overrided all the plus plus and plus equal, and all, all the arithmetic on it is going to be atomic, which means it's actually safe to do the plus pluses for multiple threads now. So uh, let's let's verify that in the big program. So uh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to make an atomic version of this lock. It is now. So don't don't need that anymore. But I just uh, I, I do atomic operations on the uh, the in. and you have to initialize. So it's it's not just a bare int anymore. Certain operations like equal. I don't know why they don't like equal. 
So, so you notice this has a little bit of performance cost, but we're still getting the 213,844. So that's uh, that, that's cool, and you know the image render is okay. So, so, so this is pretty common. I, I've definitely seen you know. Uh, so, so this is uh, uh, it's okay. This is atomic. So uh, atomic meaning indivisible, right? Like uh, two cores can be doing atomic operations at the same time, and they will not like interleave. It'll be either I do it first and then you do it, or you do it first and then I do it. Questions? Stunned silence. So when when should you use atomics versus using a full-on mutex? Yeah, and in particular, if uh, if I just have a countered update, a plus plus, a uh, one one assignment or something, then atomic is the right way to do it. And uh, if you have so anything more complicated, anything with like objects then you, you pretty much have to use a log. Does that make sense? So, so for example, uh, if I, if I want to know not only how many of them that there are, but what they are. So I could have a vector of, uh, uh, what do I want a vector of? I guess, uh, uh, so somehow I, I would identify these things. So this is like, uh, these are the big pixels and uh, so that, that's that's cool, and uh, I could I could if so if if instead of just keeping account, I take the big pixels. So uh, I'm going to push back their array index. So so now I know exactly which uh, uh, which pixels are, uh, are are big. So you can totally do this, and then uh, supposedly the big pixels dot size. So this should be the same amount. And uh, I claim if this runs at all, it's unlikely to get the correct number. Yeah, so, so you notice this, this crashes. W why does it crash? Well, So in particular, what, what would go wrong with pushback, with multiple threads are doing pushback? And it, I believe actually four threads are pushbacking at the same moment. So, so, so the, uh, first, of all, they're all pushing back onto the same vector. And uh, so, so vector starts off being empty. And then uh, the basically, you know, uh, the first thing gets pushed back, you allocate one slot for it. The next thing gets pushed back, you have to allocate more space, and then you have to copy the stuff over and then throw away the old stuff. So uh, it's essentially the the error, as far as I can tell, is that the vector was this big, and you push back one more thing. So it's like that's cool. I got to reallocate. It was about time to do it anyway. Uh, so it uh, it does a new. Okay, so uh, step one, do a new. Step two, do a copy. And step three, throw away this, uh, I delete. What happens if uh, four threads are doing it at the same time? You get four news, which is a waste of memory, but like that's not going to crash. You get four copies, which again, like, you know, it's redundant, but, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. And then you get four deletes, and uh, yeah, I have three errors. Because, uh, the first thread throws away this data, and then the next thread tries to throw away the same data. It's already been thrown away. So double double delete, of course, is like one easy way to like trash everything. So th this uh, so you know this uh, the uh, the delete actually checks, and then that's uh, that's no good. So how 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 do you fix this? Well, uh, I don't know. So we, we could try lots of stuff. I really wish this worked. So atomicify the vector. And uh, I've never seen this work. Someday, someday they should do this. Like uh, atomic requires a trivially copyable type. Like atomic doesn't work with vector. Ah, shoot. Okay, well, I, I guess uh, t uh, if, if we can't use atomic, then I have to use, I have to use a mutex. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to do the lock for the count. And I'm going to lock it. So that's cool. And the program hangs forever now. And you're like, wait. 
what uh, what did we do wrong? Oh, every time you lock it, you have to remember to unlock it. Actually, this is the ironic case where basically somehow the programmer has left the bathroom while leaving the stall locked. So the next time it has to go to the bathroom, it says, I don't know, somebody's in there. <laughs> uh, so, so, so essentially, every time you lock, you must unlock. Now, this is... Uh, this looks like an easy, sort of simple thing to do. This is surprisingly hard to guarantee in a real program. So in particular, every time I lock, I need to unlock. Like, okay, sure, just remember every time you lock, you unlock. Now the problem is, uh, at runtime, you figure out that you, for, you left off an unlock on some path. So in other words, it's, it's not something that the compiler is going to warn you about. And uh, how many ways are there to avoid doing the unlock path? Especially like, uh, as, as, as th if this function gets bigger, things get more complicated. I claim this program, under some circumstances, will fail to unlock. The circumstance being, pushback runs out of memory. The allocate fails. Uh, it throws an exception. The exception will not unlock, which means that we actually just broke the whole program. So I if you want exception safety combined with locks, this is actually a really bad way to do it. So there's a, uh, uh, there's a famously better way to do it called the lock guard. So we do. Uh, and this being C++11, I probably have messed up the syntax. Uh, okay, lock, lock guard on standard mutex. So uh, lock guard, the idea with lock guard is that the constructor of lock guard locks and the destructor unlocks. Why would, why would they do that? So what happens if this closed curly brace? Local variable, it, its constructor ran, so its destructor is going to run. Destructor is going to unlock. What happens if uh, this throws an exception so we never like leave in a normal way? Well, destructors r like run when exceptions go through here. Uh, what happens if somebody goes in and they say like uh, uh, iter equals 1000 and uh, if x equals 100 and y equals 100. Oh gosh, that's not the, I hate this student. No scholarship for them. Uh, Lockguard is actually going to do the right thing if you return unexpectedly, if there's an exception that comes tearing out, like no matter what, like there's no way to get out of here uh, and not run a destructor. At, at least it, that's, there's, uh, there's no way I know of, which is good. Uh, so so the, the lock guard is actually, the syntax is a little ugly, but uh, th this, is, this is considered the, uh, the pro way to do uh, C plus 11 locks, is some sort of scoped uh, uh, lock. Does that, does that make sense? So, uh, so uh, obvious question, I suppose, is uh, is there a performance overhead to using lock guard instead of calling dot lock and dot unlock? I think there is literally zero performance overhead. So somewhere in here, we should have uh, a bunch of little tests. So I could do. Uh, so l l let me just do a scope lock, and you notice it's in the same mutex header. So uh, with, without, uh, so we're at 19.3, uh, just calling lock and unlock manually. Uh, we're at 19.3 if you use the scope lock because uh, the constructor is trivial and gets in lines, which is good. Uh, and in particular, I believe the machine code comes out literally exactly the same. There is a pthread mutex lock and a pthread mutex unlock. Questions? So as with a lot of C++, this is a beautiful, perfect design that has a lot of hidden costs, like the 20 nanoseconds it takes to do stuff, and it doesn't really like scream what the hell is going on with it. And in particular, if you're just scrolling through a big program, you're like, lock guard, huh? Better look up what that one is. Or, or you just keep scrolling past and then you don't realize you better darn well. So, so in particular, a, a lot of these things actually really call out for comments. So this is like, this protects big count. 
And uh, one of the worst parts about locks, so, so, so sort of stepping back, uh, the theory with multi-threaded code is that uh, you just have to add these little atomics or mutexes to protect all the places where people are accessing more than one thing, uh, accessing the same thing for more than one thread. And the problem is that's uh, it's just really error prone, big programs. I in particular, if you forget one, you don't get like a compile error here. You just get the wrong answer sometimes. And that's that makes for very hard to write, hard to debug programs. Actually, it's uh, when you know there's a problem, because for example, the, the code has crashed on you, then you go in and change some code to fix it. How do you know you actually fixed it? You just do more testing, you read the manual to hopefully, like, you, 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 there's a certain, there, there's more faith here than I, I kind of like to operate on. It, it'd be nice, for example, if the, uh, uh, if, if there were perfect, absolute guarantees about uh, uh, being able to access this stuff. H how could we make perfect, absolute guarantees? So, for example, right, trying to decide between atomics and vectors and mutexes and all, all this stuff. How, how do we make this where there's no way somebody can screw it up, even if they're almost trying? So the, the, there's some argument that what you should be doing here is you should like uh, you have some class that manages this stuff, and you, you would say like the the manager dot found a uh, found one. So so for example here if I I can wrap all this class in a class manager, and uh, this is all private of course, and then we're gonna have a manager t. It's the manager. So we, we can uh, we could have a constructor if we need one. I don't think we even need one. Uh, and and in here, for example, we could have a found one, and it takes the uh, uh, the, the bad pixel, big pixel, I guess. So in here, this I feel like is actually the right place to do this because now I can do the standard lock guard stuff with the uh, standard mutex. So here's how I protect myself. Uh, so that's the guard on uh, the lock count. And, and then I can have a very clear, uh, uh, so I can have a, a comment that says like uh, everything in this class is protected by this lock. And uh, once, once I've grabbed the lock, then I know that nobody else can get to this. So, for example, I don't know, I can do big pixels pushback. And then this is going to be okay. Uh, is it, so, uh, if main needs to, it, it shouldn't just be rummaging around in these things to, to pull this stuff out. So, for example, here, this should uh, main, if it wants to know how many there are, then it could just say the manager report to pull, pull the stuff out. So, uh, report. And then this is going to so uh, obvious question if I'm if I'm asking how many I found is it safe to call size without the lock do I need the lock I'm, I'm not changing anything I, the, uh, the the worst case that could happen I think is that I read a value that's really wacky because this uh, this vector is in the process of being reallocated. So, so th theoretically possible. Uh, let's see. It doesn't like my constructors there. Yeah. So, so I, I claim this is the right way to do it. I think this doesn't. Uh, I think that's basically the same time that we had before. Uh, so, so, so in particular, uh, multi-threaded stuff is really hard to reason about, and it's hard to make work reliably. So putting all of the weird multi-threaded stuff inside a dedicated class, because like I can look at this class and you can kind of you know work out saying like uh, so, you can even you know if you're if uh, you've taken chapel classes you 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 know you want to have clear comments that, that describe the invariants and such. So uh, so so for example you could say like this is uh, this is thread safe, and uh, I don't know it, it's worse I think to say this uh, is not thread safe may report bogus. Uh, well, found one. Because I, I don't know, uh, push back while it's doing this reallocation. I'm not sure if dot size is actually going to return you something sensible. 
that that uh, I, I believe, in fact, it's it's allowed to do uh, arbitrary stuff. And then you say, you know, I want a strong, I want stronger thread guarantees here, so I'm just going to lock it, and now it is thread safe. And 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 the cool part is now. Uh, Unless somebody goes and breaks this class, like the public interface for this class is all 100% thread safe. So you, you, you're, you're guaranteed to like not crash, not do weird stuff. It's, it's gonna work. And no matter who calls it, no matter what, uh, what else is happening. Questions? Stunned silence. What, what, what do you think about threads? I think this is the last I have to talk about uh, normal CPU threads. Wow. It's a uh, yeah, uh, OpenMP. So, so I have absolutely seen cases where, for example, people are like, "No, OpenMP is great. It means you don't have to worry about whether the code's thread safe." And you're like, um, "And and you're wondering why it crashes? It crashes because you still have to worry about whether the code is thread safe." And, and in particular, if I'm doing pushbacks anywhere, like, so, so, so the, the, the annoying part is like, I'm not doing any pushbacks, I'm just calling a function. Calling a function should be okay. Like, yeah, does that function do a bunch of pushbacks? Memory allocation, thread unsafe operations, global variables? Well, I don't, I don't, yeah, yep, yep. It does, it totally does. That's why your code is crashing. <laughs> yes? I wish I knew. So I, I've heard Rust is uh, has a bunch more types that let you describe the threadiness of variables. I don't know any more details than that. So, yeah. D d d anybody in the Rust club and looked at the thread? I, I, I know one of the design goals with Rust is to make it so you don't have to like remember which things are thread safe or not. Actually, this is generally considered an awful idea. This is describing something mission critical about the code. And this is living as a comment? Like, that's insane, right? Uh, if it's mission critical, it needs to be baked into the language or the type or something, right? Like, so class manager T inherits from public uh, thread safe by golly. <laughs> Or something, right? And uh, and then if you if you are in a thread safe by golly uh, class or function, and uh, you call a non thread safe by golly class or function, that is not thread safe. And and for example, uh, uh, if I said it was thread safe by golly, and you leave off the lock, the compiler should say you can't read size. That's not thread safe, right? Because uh, because in, in particular, you really want to make sure that the machine is checking these things so that it never gets screwed up, uh, and that you know, all, all all of your your class guarantees are always hold. Because, yeah, just saying, like, having a comment is a, kind of a silly way to, to do this stuff, honestly. I don't know of a library that does. I bet there's something at Boost that does exactly that, because that's true for every uh, thing you may say. So. It, it, it's, it, it, it is hard, because thread safety is sort of a, it's, it's a property of, you know, uh, basically the, the, not only the, uh, the functions you call, but the arguments you pass to them. So, so, for example, draw Mandelbrot is unsafe if I ask two threads to draw to the same pixel, right? I don't know which thread is going to, over, you know, the, both threads are going to be trying to overwrite the pixel, and they're going to maybe be, you know, putting different values in there, and which one ends up in there is going to depend on which thread runs first. I guess in this case, uh, the color is a totally deterministic function of the location. So maybe it's, maybe it's thread safe. I, I guess if, if, if there's some sort of thread race where they're both, like, you know, I don't know which thread is going to write the value. If they're writing the same value, like I don't care whose three ended up in the variable. It's three. I'm good. Like that's uh, all, all fine. Uh, this stuff is appallingly hard to get right. I, I should say, uh, and uh, in particular, it's the rarely used stuff that really sucks. So I, I said the comment lies now, and it says this is thread safe. And then somebody removed the lock, and they removed the lock because they said like, uh, dang, this costs uh, this costs twenty nanoseconds. Right? Oh my gosh! Can't can't afford that. Uh, we, uh, you know, some some path like we we realize like, uh, well, the way I was using this class in this time, it was actually thread safe because only one person was calling it, and I can't afford that twenty nine second cost. And the problem is, then the same class gets used somewhere else in a thread unsafe context, and no one realizes that somebody broke it 
forgot to update the comment. This is the other problem with comments. And uh, now, like, yeah, all, all bets are off, right? Your, uh, your code is, is secretly going to fail. And unfortunately, a lot of these sort of multi-threaded bugs only show up in big programs that are running for a long time. That's really bad, because uh, when you're debugging, you're using small programs that run for a short period of time. So your chances of ran running into these errors is much lower. Uh, th th there, are, there are really famous examples of this. I, I don't know. We, uh, uh, so in grad school, we, uh, uh, we were building this giant parallel runtime system, Charm++, and uh, still, still being worked on, uh, by the way. Uh, it uh, people had kind of so so by the time I got there, people had started doing some uh, uh, you know some some multi-threaded stuff, and uh, it's not it's not really it it, it was uh, it was basically you know basically thread safe mostly, i.e. it crashed a lot when you turned on multiple threads, and we're like this is not okay, so we basically just set up to just pound away at it and like it run for like one minute and then crash so. We looked at what it was accessing, and then we added mutexes or atomics or make uh, you know private variables in the right spots to basically do the uh, do the the right thing for for that particular bug, and then we fired it up again, and you know it only took us like maybe a week of working at it at the point where we we actually got it to run overnight, and then for like a month or something we basically like you know we we let it run running overnight, we'd come in there'd be some weird wacky crash, and we'd try and figure out how to fix it, maybe that takes a couple of days or something. We got it to run overnight again, and. Uh, the, the, the thing we kind of realized is that this is sort of like, uh, I don't know how many bugs there are here, right? Like, you know, we, we, we fixed like maybe a dozen different uh, uh, sort of classes of bugs. Uh, and uh, uh, professional companies actually get this wrong a lot. So this is uh, Windows 98 uh, automatically downloads drivers, uh, which was sort of this cool new thing that they had added in Windows 98. And it's, it was the first sort of multi-core version. So essentially, uh, uh, this poor guy is showing like uh, you just plug in a uh, uh, you, you plug in a scanner, and uh, then uh, uh, Windows 98 just blue screens. <laughs> and yeah, that's Bill Gates, right? And this guy is like, oh my gosh, I'm so fired. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, Sure. So, yay, Windows 98. So, so like, you know, there's thousands of people in the audience. This is on CNN, right? It's like, this is super embarrassing. How many times do you think they tested, you just plug in the, you know, the scanner and it downloads the driver? Like, if Bill Gates is going to be there and thousands of people in the audience, you test this like a hundred times, right? The problem is you've just established that the error rate is less than 1%, which is cool, but you've not established it at zero. And uh, it's really hard to actually guarantee. So, so, so this is this is again where sort of I, I feel like maybe mathematicians would be better at this because they're kind of used to keeping a bunch of complex moving parts in their head and making sure that they all are perfect all the time, or else everything fails. Right? One divide by zero sneaks in, and just the whole the whole thing is, uh, is destroyed. Yeah. Or basically, well, we are hard to get math minors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the the sort of mathematical reasoning is sort of yeah maintain the invariance as you as you work your way through. Uh, so uh, next week, the uh, Wednesday, there is no class because just a universal thing. Project two topics are due Monday. Just uh, like a one sentence thing to call it at the beginning of class.